welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Let's get things kicked off. What are you guys drinking? What are you drinking? What are you drinking? I am so glad that you asked. That is Kelly. nice. Let's get things kicked off. And today, I am really excited to welcome you. Well, let's get to yeah. it. But it, it's fantastic. I'm fantastic. Kelly. It's Randy. Cheers. Hi everyone, welcome to HashMap on Tap. I want to thank you for tuning in and we really appreciate you listening to the show today. I'm Kelly, he's Randy. Randy, it's great to be hosting the show with you today on what we think is a really special episode. It's our 50th. Wow. I want to hear your thoughts on that, but to kick it off, what are you drinking today? I have a special beer for this. Um, and, and we started the started the whole series here Um wanting to drink beer and talk about data and tech and with people. So 50 episodes in, I've got a special game of Thrones beer um, that I've had my eye on for a little while. It's called my watch has ended. It's an Imperial Brown ale brewed with maple syrup and fenugreek. And I do not know what fenugreek is. I don't know what that that is. is. No, no idea. Oh, well I can definitely taste the fenugreek and it is, is a challenging spicy kind of flavor. Uh, What are you drinking today? Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. Let me ask: Is the spice is it is it a hot spice or is it a just more of a? No, it's like it's, a, it's a warmth, you know, with the maple syrup and everything. Yeah. It's um, and it okay. being a brown ale, um, it, yeah. it's actually a great beer for this time of year, early winter kind of feel. Like I can see, uh, yeah. So it, it's a little on the bitterer side, but um, the the sweetness of the syrup balances it out. It's pretty nice. Good. Nice. Well, I, in honor of the episode, I did a beer as well. I, I think the last time uh, I did a show, I did a Hella Cella. This time it's a Carbach Viva Cella. <laughs> I'm, I'm having to go you know, deep into the archives here on something that I haven't had before. But uh, this is a salt and lime uh, infused and so far really good. Enjoying it. Obviously brewed in Texas, my wow. home state. And uh, yeah, I do car box uh, quite a bit. So this one's really good. Getting Have you had this one before? The Viva Cella? I've not had that. I don't like either salty or lime style beers. Even just the thought of lime makes me think of uh, like margaritas or you know, yeah. like that. Yeah. So no, I, I tend towards something a little darker. And then car bark in general, I have had some of their stuff. Love Street. They have a Colch that's really, yeah. really good. Yep, yep. Uh, but no, I have not had that one. Well, I will. Uh, I'll nurse this one through the show. See how it does. Um, so, you, you and I. Uh, this is uh, this is show number fifty. And uh, Lee and Jackson give a shout out to them. They do a fantastic job of uh, producing these shows and getting them out into the uh, the market. And so they'd ask if we could look back and talk through some of our favorite moments from the show overall. We're going to play through some of those favorite clips from each of those shows. And I mean, 49 episodes, Randy, we've done a lot of shows, a lot of data and cloud topics, ton of guests, customers, partners, other hash mappers. This should be a lot of fun. What are your initial thoughts? Yeah, I'm excited to revisit some of these. Um, I don't know if people you know, who listen to the show know, or I mean, I know you experience this. It's weird to listen to your own voice. So um, a lot of these, it'll be maybe some of the first times I've I've heard these specific interactions since they happened. Uh, so I'm excited to to do this, but also a little uh, ready to cringe a little bit because I, I I think it's a universal truth. No one likes the sound of their own voice. I, I'm the same way, honestly. Uh, the shows that I host, I do. N- I, it doesn't matter who it is as a guest. I just don't go back and re-listen to those uh, for the same reason. But I always listen to the ones that you've uh, you've hosted and recorded, which I really enjoy. So I guess it, it, it's the same uh, same dynamic there. Yeah. All right. So here we go. We're going to kick off today. This is an early show. This is episode number six. Wow. You did with Andy Frisch, who I know you did a webinar with Andy recently. And he is with American Health Technology Group. He's also a former hash mapper. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So you guys talked about getting data pipelines done with DBT. And so let's take a listen to what Andy and Randy talked about. Yes, you need to dive in and look at the details, but at the same, be agile. Yeah. And don't try to design all the gold plating to, to cover every possible scenario. But work with tools and work with a process that can manage and handle changes that yes. will inevitably come so that when they come, you can deal with that then. So in- I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in emergent design, emergent architecture. Yeah. You know, Figure out something that helps you get the next two or three steps down the road 
work with it for a while, inspect it, and adapt it to what it needs to become to be better. There, there's something about data warehousing in particular. And I don't know if this is just a legacy mindset or what, but I see a lot of clients think, okay, we just need to gather the requirements and then we'll know what the data warehouse needs to be. And then we'll build the data warehouse and now we're done. Like it's a house. And <laughs> yeah. that's not true. That may have been more true uh, in days past, but today it's a living, breathing thing, right? With changing requirements, changing sources, sources change in all different kinds of ways. And the tools you would use today are not the ones you're going to use tomorrow. So if you decide you're going to build this warehouse with an upfront design uh, investment that will pay off because it'll just be done, uh, I think you're going to be you're going to be burned if you don't accept change as a first class activity in your process. Right. And I really struggled with that when I was first thinking about my approach to data modeling in this data yeah. warehouse, because there's been a lot of good work over 20, 30 years. And, you know, like Kimball uh, star schema modeling and data vault patterns and all kinds of stuff from modeling your data. And I was trying to figure out what am I going to use here? And uh, after iterating on that for a while, I, I realized, you know what, there's too much change for me to lock myself into a particular pattern at this point. Yeah. And so uh, having the tools that allow me to be agile and change my design quickly and easily was more important to me than uh, a hard data modeling pattern. And so I'm, I'm going with what works for right now that makes good sense based off of the business that I'm working with and relying on the tools to help me change it when I need to. Okay. And, may and maybe we will evolve into a more structured approach to data modeling, but perfect data modeling doesn't pay the bills. Yeah. What, pays the, what pays the bills and what, what creates the value is the stuff that comes out of the other end of the pipe. Man. And the data modeling is just the, in the middle. Randy, I mean, that was a great show. And, and I think you and Andy were talking about something that comes up a lot with yeah. most of our customers. And that's this notion of how do I balance the need to get flexibility with the cloud data warehouse versus doing this work effort, putting this effort and energy into upfront design. And I thought you guys had a really interesting conversation around that. I, I really like that discussion with Andy and Andy specifically working with him is such a joy because I would say he is the most advanced agile mind I've ever worked with. So really being able to go beyond just the the rituals that we think of when we say agile, go towards what we're actually trying to achieve. There's real value there. And when he says something like perfect data modeling doesn't pay the bills, I mean, that's just, that captures it, right? Um, while it's, it's great busy work and you can generate lots of PowerPoints for that, the perfect data model is not on its own a solution. Um, so I like to think about that when we're talking about anything we're doing in the data warehousing world. Because if you're not focusing on what actually is of importance, if you don't have that goal in mind, the what and the why and the how doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, I think, you know, in if you go back, say, 20 years when it was basically one type of data, we had structured data coming into the data warehouse from our source databases, right, relational. Now, I mean, we've got an onslaught of data sources. We've got an onslaught of data types. And to put a rigid structure around your data warehouse or cloud data platform uh, can really box you in if you're not careful. Correct. And it can ultimately, I think, distract you from actually figuring out what, what is the outcome? What should the dashboard or the widget or the, the, the decision that needs to be made be if all you do is focus on type two dimensional modeling, which has its place for sure, but it is not itself a, a value add in my opinion. Yeah, and it can also distract you from that equation we talk about a lot, that simple equation, speed to impact, right? Oh, speed yeah. to business impact gets you relevancy. And if you take too long, you will become irrelevant very, very quickly. People will go find another way to do it. All right, cool. All right, let's, uh, let's go into clip number two. So you had, we've got a, a great partner, uh, Fivetran. Yep. They have, they have uh, a really uh, interesting solution. You talked on episode 31, kind of in the middle of, uh, of this year, you talked with Fraser Harris, uh, one of their product directors about this notion of maniacal focus on user experiences. Let, let's listen to what Fraser had to say. There was this great quote, uh, from the founder of Mixpanel, or he tweeted, um, great products are not from adding things, it's from maniacal focus on one good problem. I think I added the word maniacal, but <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I, I like it. Our, our, our VP of customer success is always like, maniacal, we got to be maniacal, all right? It's like, all right, Troy, I'm with you. We're maniacal. Okay. Uh, and, but it really is like, how to, 
how why is Fivetran a great product? And in my mind, and I, I think most of our customers would agree, it's because of this maniacal focus on ease of use. And it, we just keep going back to the same set of problems being like, well, where are where's the friction here? Where, where and friction comes in from in terms of the user experience, like how does someone set up Fivetran? How does someone understand what Fivetran is doing? How fresh is their data? Questions like that. But even more, in my mind, uh, the most important user experience of Fivetran, the most important user interface is the data and the schema that you see in the data warehouse. And the most important user experience is the queries you write. And we have this maniacal focus, a team of product managers as well as, uh, as engineers working on making great schemas. And I think that's extremely unique in our in this industry. Is that real? Yeah. And so, if you are ever thinking about, well, you know, what tool should I use? You have to set up Fivetran and actually see the data because your your analysts will be so much more productive. Like from even like tiny things, uh, like consistently uh, calling columns, certain things, so that you know, just reading the schema, you know what that is. Like, is this a yeah. primary key? Well, it, like it ends with underscore ID. Um, to like broader things where it's fully normalized, which means there's never any denormalized data, any duplicates. There's always one place with the correctly updated data, and we guarantee that it's updated. Yeah, so with that clip, um, that was really interesting, and it's a good example of you, Kelly, recruiting awesome guests for this program. Because uh, the first one with Andy, he was a friend of mine, early episode, I, I had an instinct he might say yes, but... Uh, getting VP of product for Fivetran, and they had just announced their unicorn status, right? That was they were hot right yeah. then. They're still hot now. Yeah. Um, so that's been really exciting to be able to get these interesting people from very large organizations, and for him to discuss some of their focus on ease of use. Uh, it it just brings to the four point. When I think of the stack, the modern data stack that I get to use, if I had to pick the one piece, please don't send me back to Hadoop. It would be the Fivetran piece. I, I love Snowflake. I love DBT. I, I love a lot of these uh, tools, but um, I would rather wrestle with Spark than have to go back to writing endless, endless ETL personally. Uh, what did you think of that clip? Yeah, no, I, I love that idea of reducing friction in the in the data engineering, data integration pipeline, and, and really the whole process. And, and I feel like he was talking about, I don't know that he said these words, but that idea of working backwards from the user experience, what is that user expecting? How can we improve that user's life by what we're doing in the data delivery space, I thought was really, really interesting. And um, I think, you know, Fivetran as a fully automated, fully managed solution in that space, if, if, if those data sources and targets are available in the Fivetran portfolio, I like to think about it. I mean, there's just, there's no reason you should not try that out. I mean, it's right. literally that simple. And, and, and uh, you just, especially now their, their pricing models change from, I yeah. think, even when we recorded that, I didn't know if, if this is out mm -hmm. at that time or not. But now there, there's no upfront commitment. You can just turn it on, give it a try. And then honestly, I cannot see going and seeing it's a competitive advantage to save 20 bucks a month uh, and spend tons and tons of developer hours to get some some source done by hand. That's going to change. Yeah. It's going to break. Just use that tool. I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm, you did uh, reference the fact that uh, recruiting is tough. It doesn't matter what type of recruiting you're doing. And we do yeah. really appreciate all the guests who've come on the show. I know they've uh, they've kind of gotten asked out of the blue in a lot of cases. So uh, really nice to uh, to have a, a wide variety of guests. Hey, let's let me let me ask you. We've had a number of hash mappers on the show, and you did a, you did an episode with a Chinmayi Lakat. Oh, that yeah. was a yeah. lot. I thought it was a lot of fun. She's not a long, long time hash mapper, been here a couple of years. And you guys talked a little bit uh, about the interview process at HashMap. So let's take a listen to that. And I can't believe it's already been 10 years now that I'm in this field. And uh, so I was in Bangalore, right now in Canada. I moved here for uh, about a year ago. And that's when I interviewed for HashMap. Uh, and uh, I'm glad I, because Hashmap was the only company that really uh, interviewed me in depth about a lot of concepts um, in Spark. Uh, it's, it's one of the platforms to do your big data processing. And I enjoyed the interview. It was different. It was more technical, more geared towards how an engineer would think, challenged you, you know? So that's how I, I got yeah. on board. And it's been a year now and I'm, I'm liking it. 
Really? Okay. So now this isn't your first time in consulting, right? Actually, Have you always worked no, as a consultant? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is my first time yeah. consulting because I've been like a uh, secluded, sit in your cubicle, software engineer, going tap a tap a tap on my system. But, and that was about it. And that's what's so refreshing about this, you know, because I think this is gearing me up for the next um, uh, role, so to speak. So it's it's not just about yeah. um, coding away in a private corner. Once you get to a certain point, you might also learn how to share the knowledge. Yeah. No, that's important. And, and you mentioned the technical interview with HashMap. I also had a super technical interview, which was um, <laughs> kind of scary. Uh, so I got I got on a flight with a backpack to go to our headquarters in Atlanta, super last minute for like an in person interview. I was recommended by a friend uh, for this role. I fly, I meet the owners, um, it's super late. We go to their office, it's like getting dark and um, they're both just like mad dogging me, right? Just yeah. like staring me down. Sounds like a uh, movie. Then, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It was like a movie. It, the whole time, I'm so nervous because uh, I'd never considered a career in consulting. I was leaving Exxon at the time, which a lot of my like peers, from their perspective, once you have that gig, you're like set. Like you could just chill at Exxon for 30 years, uh -huh. collect a pension uh -huh. and be done. But I wanted to do something different. And um, you're right, the, the technical nature of the interview, we ended up talking about like how CPUs do like instruction wow, pipelining, which I had no I had no business discussing that. Uh, our, our founder, right, he's got an electrical engineering background. So he's just like throwing it at me. Um, and we talked Spark as well. So I agree, the interview process for HashMap is something that's nice because it's not just like, I don't know, something that annoyed me in job interviews is, they'd be like, okay, what were your grades in, in like university? And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? Because are you serious? That's what you want to ask me? And hash map, they That's just never true. ask Exactly, because what's that. important, you know, uh, in this field is uh, whether you can apply the concepts. You'll be expected to learn all the way uh, throughout your lifetime here yeah. in this industry. That's fine. But are you able to apply it? Challenge yourself, think. Yeah. Yep. And there's also like components of being able to work together, work under pressure, yeah. like uh, to like, be yeah. communicative. You develop yourself in a in a well rounded manner, you know. Yeah. All right. So, Randy, I mean, you know, you talk about somebody like Chen Mai, who a lot of times is behind the scenes, if you will. I mean, that she's yeah. certainly working with our key customers on a daily basis, but it's not like you know she's out there creating videos and doing webinars and a lot of customer facing things, other than that project that she may be on. And I think there's. There's a lot of hidden gems like Chen Mai hidden across HashMap that may interact with one customer. And it was really interesting to uh, to hear this conversation that you guys had about some of the interview process here. That has been such an, uh, an exciting part of doing this podcast specifically because it gives you an excuse to like break out of the normal rut of who does what, who talks to who. So otherwise, Chen Mai, I mean, we might chat when things go wrong or a new project starting up, but if things are going, you know, smoothly and she's still on a project, we might not chat um, unless something like this comes up. So being able to speak with her, it was really exciting and to be able to uncover uh, these hidden gems, like you said. And that that interview process, I wanted to mention, that was exactly three weeks or three years ago this week that that happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and the interviewing process, I think, has gotten a little less intimidating, but no less um, technical. I, I can see you walking into that Roswell headquarters office right as it's getting dark, going, what oh, in yeah. the world am I getting into here? <laughs> it, it was a big risk, but it paid off, yeah. man. I'm so, so happy that I... Um, got on that flight and took the jump. We had a, a super young uh, child at the time and it was like, man, are we doing the right thing? And three years in, I can attest 100% that was the right call. Yeah, I mean, we we just get, there's so many opportunities. It seems like every day we're presented with a new technology, a new solution problem, a new yeah. data challenge, a new cloud challenge. Rarely is it the same thing two days in a row. And I think that's what makes our business really, really interesting and how we work with customers uh, just changes day to day. That in that variety, though, there are some core skill sets or patterns. I, I'm reading Ray Dalio's Principles right now, uh, which is a fantastic book. And one of the recurring ideas in the book is like every new opportunity is usually one some variation of another one of those, another one of this situation or that situation. Mm -hmm. And even though the tech is changing, the landscape changes uh, quite a lot, the way we interact with clients, especially this year, has changed quite a lot there's still a lot of another one of those opportunities where we can take the lessons like Chimai has mentioned in that 
in that episode um, of Spark and Hadoop and repurpose those for a cloud-first environment. So uh, you're right, the tech changes, but having that lineage really helps you to, to learn and move fast. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, so uh, for this next one, uh, I'm gonna introduce this one for you. This is Growing with Empathy with User Testing CEO Andy McMillan. So he's a CEO of a massive, really successful organization that's changing the way people think about getting users feedback, right? It's not just a form anymore. Like, how do you really understand what a user's feeling or thinking and really get to the core of what you should be designing for? So how did this come about? How did you get to have Andy on the show? Yeah, Andy's a great guy. We had worked together. So his his firm had been acquired. I think it was Stellan at the time. Stellan had been acquired by Oracle. And I was with Oracle at the time. And um, Stellan was a content management solution. And so Andy ended up uh, working with me. I can't remember how many customers, a number of the, the key customers that I had at the time, uh, helping promote some of the content management capabilities that Oracle was bringing to the table at the time. We got to be friends and uh, actually had not talked uh, recently and just extremely gracious. One of the nicest guys you will ever meet. And I think it comes across in in uh, certainly this episode overall that he's a guy you would absolutely want to work for. I, I also, I want to circle back. You had mentioned when you came on board, you guys are about 40 million ARR. Yep. And you've been there about two and a half years. Have you, have you approached that magical 100 million ARR number yet or... That is literally the question of the day, Kelly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to refresh my dashboard where we're done speaking, but uh, yes. we, might, we might pass that while we're talking, honestly. <laughs> that's like that's, great, man. that's where we are, like right now. Cheers um, to 100 so. million ARR, man. That is yeah. awesome. That, it's that's a really big moment. Fantastic yeah. growth over the last couple of uh, two and a half years. All right. You had, I, I uh, checked out an article that you'd written. You, you were talking about the fact that if companies only, focus on data and analytics. And, and we are, a, you know, full disclosure, we are a data and analytics consulting firm. But you said that can limit you. What did you mean by that? What I mean is you would, I wouldn't want to drive without either of those, right? I wouldn't want to run my company without data and analytics. And I wouldn't want to run it without the insights of talking to, to, to people, the anecdotes that make the understanding happen, the empathy that comes from that. You both don't want to run your world entirely out of uh, a conversation you've had with a handful of customers. At the same time, it's really hard to motivate your whole company if the goal is to get something from 37% to 39% and you can't explain mm -hmm. who cares about that or why it matters or show them what that's really about. And so we think the value is the idea that you're bringing these things together. I want to understand if if conversion on this area of my flow is dropping, I need to know that. I also need to know why, and I need to know with whom is it dropping, and how do I connect with them and understand what that is? Is it changing preferences? Is it some design change that we've made? Is it sentiment about another brand that's in the space? Like I, I have to go in and, and yeah. find that out. And I actually find when you marry the two, when you're explaining to folks what's happening, is really powerful. And and I know. Um, we never like to think of politicians as the way things get done, but you'll notice that when politicians over hundreds of years are trying to figure out how to compel people to do something, they usually tell you about the data. They'll tell you some story about whatever it is, you know, healthcare or the military, doesn't matter what it is, pick a topic. Right, right. And then they tell you about a person they met in Iowa, you know, and it's like you, you kind of, you get, you get this image and you go, oh, like I understand the emotional part of why this matters. And I yeah. think that's when these two worlds kind of come together. Like I want to understand what's happening. I want to understand it holistically. I want to understand what I'm measuring. I also want to understand like, how does it impact people? Like how do they feel when this happens? Why does this matter to my business? And, and I think neither of those are replaceable. Like you need both of those. Man, that, that whole episode is such a gold mine. Uh, just the way he talks about the, the detective work of really getting into the story and the why and the who of using apps or using services. Uh, it's really compelling, man. I could have just listened to that for a long time. Yeah. It, you know, he makes so many great points throughout that episode. And, and even in that clip, I think he's, he's talking a little bit about the way that if you, if you just look at data and, and we rely on it a lot, I mean, there's no, there's no, no two ways about it. We can become extremely dependent on what the data tells us. Yeah. But I think his point that he's trying to make is there's always a story behind that as well. 
Um, you know, what, what's the true meaning? What's the true reason uh, behind why something is happening or what you're trying to achieve? And, and I think if we can dig into, call it that story a little bit, that's behind the numbers, uh, we can really understand our business a lot better. The coolest part to me, though, man, on that Andy, on that show was that hundred million right ARR. He, huh. So forty million to a hundred million in two and a half years is just phenomenal. And it, he was literally re hitting refresh on the dashboard. He said his sales ops they just had a few more deals they needed to get in. He just needed a couple hundred thousand dollars. So that's a big moment. It, and he talked in that episode about his role like taking over for like a founder ceo and what that process was like man that's a great episode yeah that's it's very different right you come in yeah. uh, if you are a founder ceo versus taking over for a founder ceo i mean those are two really a lot of pressure oh, right yeah. probably a beloved founder ceo like there's a, a cult of personality behind this person and it, also being able to say you know what the thing that got me here isn't going to get me there just a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, he's he's done that at least twice that I know of. Definitely an episode worth checking out. So, all right, number number five on the list, Randy. So, Snowflake's been a fantastic partner with Hashgraph oh, yeah. since 2018. Last three years, just really off the charts. And you had an opportunity to have a good friend of ours, Kent Graziano, on the show to talk a little Snowflake. This was early, early in the show. Oh, yeah, the man himself. Yeah, we were lucky to get this guy too. Oh, episode seven, and I, I remember. Um, we were at, I want to say maybe it was a data for breakfast. I can't remember what the event. Oh, yeah. Was. And you went up, just walked right up to them. Yeah. And just, I, I was a little awestruck because he's he's the guy, right? He's yeah. the, the chief evangelist. Couldn't be more down to earth. Yeah. Traveling all over the place. And and again, just just really humble, really gracious. Oh, yeah. Happy to come on the show. And, and uh, uh, everybody, for everybody listening in, we've got a, he's our first repeat guest as well. So that show will be out there in a little while. But let's listen to this clip that uh, Lee and Jackson put together and uh, see, see what uh, Ken had to say. One of the things that they added shortly after I joined was the multi-cluster warehouse. Yeah, and the whole system is called multi-cluster shared data architecture. But then we added a feature called multi-cluster warehouse that allows you to do automatic horizontal scaling. Yeah. So you, you start with a, a single cluster of however many nodes and set it up for the multi-cluster warehouse. Then if it starts getting a concurrency contention because too many users coming in, so that example I gave before, you got 100 users and it's been running along fine and now all of a sudden it's 200 and then 300 and then 400 and the queries start getting queued multi-cluster warehouse will automatically spin up a parallel cluster and load balance between those two clusters and it can go all the way out to 10 clusters and that was just like incredible because that was always the challenge we were trying to do when i worked in the oracle space in particular is you know how do we get more cpus how do we distribute this and I know in yeah. the Teradata world and the other MPP systems, people were always challenged with that is, do we have enough nodes? And, yeah. and how do we spread that load out easily so that everybody gets to do what they want? And basically, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to do. And in Snowflake, it's you set up the feature, and then you don't do anything. The system uses you know statistics and metadata and a little bit of machine learning to go, hey, We've got a bunch of queries over here starting to queue up. Okay. Yeah. Turn on this parallel, turn on this node, configure it. And it's in this nearly instant, which is the crazy part on top of it. Yeah. So, man, Ken hit on some great thoughts there. And I, as he was talking, I was thinking that, you know, for, for us, I mean, Snowflake checks a lot of those boxes. He talks specifically about that scalability aspect of Snowflake, which is, which is almost unmatched in the industry right now. Thoughts on that episode in that particular clip, Randy? Gosh, Kent is just, he, he's one of the most interesting people to talk to while not being intimidating. All right. He just, his passion for the subject matters is infectious. It makes you want to talk more about it and geek out and just build that community. So I really like being in a room that Kent's in or being on a call that Kent's on. Uh, and that technology specifically, that moment, he's talking about that spark when you first really realize how different Snowflake is. And I think after working with Snowflake for a few years, it can be easy to take for granted all it's, all it's offering is, oh, of course it's great. But none of what Snowflake 
does, at least to me, was obvious until you saw it. Like a lot of good design. It's, it's obvious in retrospect, but until you see it, like you just don't know. And working on that first Snowflake project ever, I was only coming in because it was kind of a sticky sequel um, issue that we were trying to do for a demo for a Zero to Snowflake training. Our old uh, CTO was working on it and didn't have time, so he asked me to take a look at it. And I got the sequel out, and I was expecting that to be the the easy part, right? Because in Spark, that's the easy part. And um, in Impala and in these other tools, the easy part is the query. Um, and then I ran the query and it was done. It was like, wait, that... That's it. That's all you have to do is no sequel and you're done. Man, that just thinking about, I remember telling uh, Chris at the time, our old CTO, and I feel like a one man army now, all the things I can do with this, like, gosh, let's move on to bigger problems. Yeah, no, that's, I, I agree. And, and again, you, you go back and you look at Snowflake uh, to where it was and where it is today, I guess when it started and where it is today. And, um, you know, you're just, you're able to move so fast, create those outcomes so quickly. And, and really that ecosystem's continuing to, uh, to expand as well around it. So I'm having more and more choice. So yeah, looking forward to, to hearing more from Kent uh, in the near future on the show. So <clears throat> we've certainly had, uh, we've talked a little bit, uh, a couple of the clips, hash mappers and partners. And uh, obviously a customer, we had another customer on, you You talked to uh, Yvonne Alvarez with NCR uh, a few episodes yeah. back and had a really interesting, I, I would say it was, there certainly was talk about technology, but you guys also hit on some, I guess, more philosophical topics and partnership and collaboration, trust type topics. I think it's really interesting um, what you guys dove into. So let's, let's have a listen to uh, Yvonne and, and Randy. So in order to really be able to deliver the ability to partner with key stakeholders outside of your enterprise, in this case, vendors, I never made it to big uh, success, a uh, big success program without, without a vendor that was my partner. So I'm a true believer in partnerships with vendors. This is very key for us. I was just going to say, I really like your emphasis on trust as being kind of uh, a core concept that you need to think about when you're doing some of these exploratory uh, technology enterprises, explorations, when you want to deliver to teams that are maybe not inside your organization or um, teams that are, but they're maybe separate from yours, that earning that trust and keeping that trust is critical to the long-term success. And I think about that a lot as a consultant, because I'm often coming into an environment where uh, we need to build credibility credibility very quickly uh, to be able to build consensus and have everyone pulling in the same direction so that we can deliver something of value. So I love hearing that you you think about trust and you focus on trust because that's something uh, we do as well at HashMap. Absolutely. You know, I've seen it. And uh, I think uh, HashMap uh, for me has demonstrated that uh, is willing to take risk as well. Uh, not always, um, you know, seeking uh, necessarily a, a, a revenue or seeking an increase on the business, but uh, actually, you know, doing an honest, I'll say, assessment of what are the opportunities, and, and that is really key. That's been something that's attracted me to HashMap and has kept me here for, gosh, three years uh, and counting, right? Is that I'm never in a position where I have to just recommend a tool or an approach to a, a client that would maybe be good for us in the short term, but is bad for that client. I can always give a legitimate, good faith uh, recommendation for an architecture or an approach that is going to be best for the client. And maybe month to month, right? We might not be able to, to I don't know, sell five additional consultants, but long term over the course of five years, 10 years with a client, uh, we can build a much richer relationship. So I, I, there are companies who I think do that kind of consulting approach where they're really just looking for the short term, throw people on something, even if it's not the right fit for a client. Um, and, and I think that's a valid way to do business, sure, but it's just not the way I would prefer to do it. And I really like that about HashMap. Yeah, Randy, as you guys were talking on that show, I was thinking about I mean, we at HashMap, we have, there's a lot, we have a lot of responsibility as a trusted advisor and partner to our customers. And I, and I think that yeah. Yvonne and, and you hit on that really strongly. And I, I think sometimes you can, 
you can take it for granted or you can lose sight of it. You get all excited about the technology, but there's times where, and I'd like your opinion on this, we have to say things that to, to a customer that may not necessarily win friends and influence people, but it has to be said. We've got to give them the, the straight scoop on something. Yeah, that's a delicate uh, balance to strike. And, and I always feel like I'm, I'm, I'm tweaking as I go along. And I think we all always are. But uh, having an emphasis on reckoning with the responsibility of someone coming to you and saying, you know what, you're the expert. I'm going to trust my success, my reputation, my company on what you say and what you recommend. Um, that's a pretty serious responsibility. And uh, I don't think you get very far running a business if you take that lightly. Uh, so that's something at HashMap that's very nice is that we're able to take that seriously and regardless of who it makes upset, really be that vendor neutral voice in a conversation. Um, but I think long term, everyone you know tends to to benefit from that approach. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I really appreciate Yvonne and the team at NCR. So uh, this next clip, um, I don't know, maybe now uh, people have heard of Fishtown Analytics. A lot of people certainly have heard of DBT, but Man, these guys have gotten on the map. Yep. April, uh, Series A, 12.9. Uh, November, what is that? Six months later, followed that up with a Series B, 29.5. If you didn't know who Fishtown Analytics and DBT were, then you certainly do know now. And you were fortunate enough to have Drew Bannon on the show. He's one of the co-founders. You guys shared a, a gen and DBTonic, I think. I'm not sure how to say that. And uh, got a chance to talk about, um, you know, how Drew started out at DBT, some of the challenges of building a company. And and I just thought it was a really cool episode. Any initial thoughts on that one? I, Drew is just so uh, generous with his time, both for, you know, a podcast like this. I, I know he's been in other, other uh, programs and then in the DBT Slack as well. If anyone has a question, he's always jumping in and helping people. Um, and I know he's busy doing other stuff, especially with all this fundraising. Yeah, that, that's a good point. If you're not uh, part of the DBT Slack community, definitely check that out. Very, very active. All right, let's check out this clip with Drew and Randy. Uh, we started building DBT as an open source project back when we worked at a company called RJ Metrics. And you might have heard of Stitch Data. They spun out of RJ in about 2016. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. So we all, we were very close with the Stitch folks. We've worked with many of them in the past. Um, who Stitch is now owned by um, uh, Talent. the other one. Talent. Talent. Thank yeah. you. Yes. So that, you know, it's pretty exciting for the Philly tech scene in general. But um, that's just to say, we started building DBT when the, the foundations of Stitch were being formed at RJ Metrics. And so we saw the power of a database like Redshift. We saw that BI is really hard to do on top of raw data directly. Yeah. Because um, you know, Stitch existed effectively, and we had raw data, but we had no tools to, to do anything with it or yeah. to like build our own data models. To, to get every, I think we used mode at the time. Every mode report we wrote was like hundreds of lines because yeah. we were doing all the data modeling work at BI time. And so we started building DBT there, and it was just a way to build a, um, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph of views DBT initially only supported views on Redshift. Yep. And you could just type DBT run. There were like no options. It built all <laughs> your views in dependency order. Um, and that was that was how it worked for a few months. And you know, when when Stitch ended up spinning out, it was because RJ Metrics was uh, acquired at the time. And uh, we spun out Fishtone Analytics at the same time to to build DBT and uh, at the time do a lot of consulting work um, implementing advanced analytics on this new stack for, for other companies. Yeah. And what made you decide to start your own company? Like you personally drew, how did you decide like, yeah, I'm going to make this jump. Is this something that's been an interest of yours for a long time or did it kind of surprise you? If I drink six more gin and tonics, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the real truth. Okay. Um, just kidding. It, it wasn't really something I planned to do. Yeah. Uh, at, at that point, I mean, here's, here's the full truth. I was, uh, still in college when RJ metrics was, um, kind of split apart into some different companies and Fishtown spun out. I just graduated, I think like a week after that was announced. And so I was trying to yeah, figure wow. out like, what do I want to do for my career? And I saw Tristan was, you know, I worked with Tristan at RJ Metrics directly. Um, Tristan was starting Fishtown and I thought, um, I don't have anything better going on right now. And uh, I enjoy working on DBT. So maybe we'll just keep doing it. But this is like a thing that we used internally. Nobody really knew about it. We were excited. But um, it wasn't obvious that 
that if you fast forward in four years, it would I would be on a podcast with people asking me questions <laughs> about it at, at that time anyway. So I'm, I'm very glad I did and fortunate to have been surrounded by so many great folks at RJ Metrics that I learned a ton from um, and got to be in this environment like so so early. But yeah, the truth is I, I feel like I hopped on, what's the expression? I don't know. I feel like I was kind of at the right place at the right time to, to be in that situation. And we just yeah. very much like rolled with it from there. Tristan wow. wrote about the early days a lot recently in, in a blog post um, that just came out about how like, you know, really there's two, there's two big things that got us, got, that got the ball rolling, like got momentum behind DBT. It was some high profile companies in New York using DBT that were really enthusiastic about it. Yeah. That was very encouraging for us. And um, two was like, honestly, a lot of this anonymous event tracking where we could see like, oh, it's not three companies that are using DBT, it's 10. And then the next you know, month, it's not 10, but it's 20. And you're like, okay, well, what's going to happen next month? Hey, uh, Randy, so just yeah. so much to hit on in that show. I know you and I are, are both uh, fans of also Nathan Latka's uh, podcast. He has tons, <laughs> of, tons of SaaS startups on there. But man, what Drew was talking about with Fishtown and DBT, you go back and something I know we're passionate about at HashMap as well, these open source roots, this open source community-based approach. Recently, uh, they just uh, announced, uh, uh, Fishtown announced that they're they're making available, for instance, DBT fundamentals training at no charge. I mean, yeah. this these are the kind of things you see from open source founded companies. And I, I just, it was just a fantastic discussion. This was what, a month after their series A round, right? Oh yeah, it just happened. And I oh, mean, Drew, he talks about DAGs so much. Uh, and that got me thinking about for maybe a week or so after this episode, just the, the interesting parts of a DAG or just graphs in general. And that was the roots of the idea that maybe we should start Snowflake Inspector. Is that the, right? um, wow. The graphical view of this, this, this graph. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if it's acyclic or not, so it might not be a, a DAG, but it is directed. And it, it's cool to go back and revisit this and see those kernels start to germinate. Man, that, that is awesome. I, I, the thing that always has stood out to me, uh, and I think you said this as it relates to DBT, you may have been talking to a customer at the time. In fact, I think you were. You said, you know, Mr. Customer, if you don't use DBT, if you don't take that and incorporate it into your, your architecture, you will have to build DBT. You essentially are yeah. going to, Those are your to options. customize it. It is that critical to what you're doing from a cloud uh, data warehousing perspective. Absolutely. So, yeah, really, really cool. Great show. So next clip, this is this one was so intimidating to me. I asked you, please, Kelly, early on, can you take this one? Denise Pearson, uh, Chief Marketing Officer for Snowflake. Uh, massive, super successful, largest tech IPO ever. And uh, Kelly, the man, as usual, comes through and gets an incredible guest on this show. What do you think about this episode? So Denise, again, one of one of the nicest ladies. She's very intense, but man, she's just got a passion. So CMO of Snowflake, she's got this passion for having marketing be this enabler for sales, not having marketing uh, exist on its own, but but marketing really is a driver for sales. And uh, just, just had a great time. Uh, obviously, we were, uh, I don't remember what month this was exactly, probably May, June, something like that. And, uh, you know, everybody's... Uh, working from their home office and everything. So I think just that more personalized approach, you got to hear Denise talk about a lot of different things related to uh, what she has to do on a day-to-day -day basis with marketing, plus talk about some of the changes they've had to make yeah. uh, with where we are in 2020. Yeah, let's hear what Denise had to say. I think the one thing that holds true at this time is providing you know highly educational and foundational content, right? The the um, content is is king, and I, this is of course something you are exceptional at at HashMap as well. If I have to give you um, some feedback on that as well, so um, and if, yeah, if we now look, we will now we of course use data extensively at Snowflake to really understand what our customers you know gravitating towards. And uh, it's all that really foundational, educational, you know, content. Um, in the past, we did a lot of workshops um, with, uh, you know, virtual, you know, uh, with ha with our hands-on lab, those things. We actually moved many of those labs virtually about six months ago. 
every week we have over a thousand people sign up for those um, virtual hands-on labs. So I just want to, that's it's for every, it's something for everyone to think about. There are actually a lot of things that can be done virtually that we didn't think was possible, um, you know, before. So, yeah, Randy, that, that show was a lot of fun to do. And, and the thing that stands out about that particular clip was, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, what Denise has done from a marketing standpoint at Snowflake with delivering what she calls educational content, really without expecting yeah. anything in return, this high value content. You've seen her come to market, I don't know how many times with something different over the last six, eight months during 2020, uh, whether it be a, you know, a children's activity book, whether it be um, you know, a, 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 a webinar approach that's a little bit different, uh, whether it is a technical guide and just continuing to provide value, provide value. And I think that's something that, you know, we've tried to take and learn from and emulate as best we could and can uh, over the last number of months. And I think that, uh, you know, you look at what they're doing from a marketing standpoint, it's just, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of the standard bearer. That's always really impressive. And uh, here on the next clip, number nine, um, this is from episode 24, the Matillion story from Manchester with VP of product, David Langton. Uh, so this is one that you took and you started to talk about the Matillion story. Y you want to say something about that? Yeah, no, this was a lot of fun. Matillion's another great partner, uh, focuses in the, in the data integration space, uh, has some incredible tools that are helping uh, customers across industries. What was most interesting about this particular episode, so David is in Manchester in the UK. So I think his time was, it was either 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So, you know, kind of winding the day down. Well, for me, it was 9 a.m. early. And oh, he yeah. decided to go with a, you know, on our show, we always let the guests choose the beverage, right? So yep. uh, he had chosen a rum. The closest thing that I had to a rum, remember, this is 9 a.m., I... <laughs> I had a uh, I had a port that was about as close as I could equate to a rum. So, needless to say, by the end of the show, uh, you know things were were it was it was a long day from there. But we had a great time. Oh yeah, ready for it. Yeah, night. exactly. All right, let's see what David had to say. So, if I think back to to the early days, we were we were working um, all out of a single office on the outskirts of Manchester. And, and when I say office, I, I'm really bigging it up there because it was really a converted shed. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a high spec uh, plush office building by any standards. Uh, but that's not a criticism at all because you can move really fast with 10 people in one room and no distractions. And that was definitely the case. You know, we, we, we weren't standing still. And then if you fast forward to now a couple of hundred people We've got a lot of people in the UK, mostly around Manchester. We've got a, a fairly big footprint in Denver, uh, then New York and Seattle. And I just wouldn't ever have imagined in 2012 that those things would even exist in 2020. Uh, you know, it, it, it really has. It, I don't I'm not sure if any of us did, if I'm honest. Uh, so, yeah, it's just it's just quite um, uh, awesome to take a step back and see it. That is that is great. Uh, well, let's transition into some of the thoughts that you have around, um, you know, outlook and, and and leadership and so forth. You you've been with Matillion for a while. Are there some things that stand out to you, both as a Matillion as a product, but also Matillion as a company that you really are proud of that that, that stand out? I, I, do, I do remember back. When we took our very first uh, dollar, it was a dollar thirty-seven. Actually, it was one unit <laughs> uh, on AWS Cloud Marketplace uh, at the start of the journey of Matillion ETL for Redshift. That had a bigger impact on me than any kind of benchmark we've met since. Because before that, it was a really good idea that we had a lot of hope for, but we'd not proven the willingness to pay. Willingness to use, we were pretty sure of, right? Because we were using it ourselves. But willingness to pay is another dimension. And because we were pricing it in a very different way, you know, an ETL tool you pay for by the hour was not a thing back then. So it was kind of that was new as well. Um, and so just, just not doing any marketing yet, because we weren't ready for that, but having it listed 
and somebody just stumbled across it and gave it a try. And that, by the way, that's a customer that's still with us today. Oh, um, yeah, that's which, awesome. Which is an even nicer story. But, uh, yeah, just, just seeing that first report with it wasn't a zero um, was, was awesome. Yeah, Randy, I mean, we just had such a good time on the show. As David was talking there, um, I was thinking, listening in, is that, you know, you look at, you, you go, all of us, we're, we're hitting it hard day by day by day, and you have, you know, constant challenges, you've got victories, you've got just, but just this day-to-day -day grind, and when you, when you look at the day before, it's so hard sometimes to see progress, so I think yeah. what one thing I picked up from David is taking that little bit longer term, say here, here I am today, or here Matillion is today. Here's where we were two, three, four years ago from where our first customer with a dollar thirty-seven, and here we are today, <laughs> converted completely from really, I would say they started out almost as a consulting services company to a true product company, SaaS based. All of those things, it just, you know, your perspective is so important. And I think he drew a really, did a really good job of, of kind of drawing that out and, and showcasing where Matillion was and where they are today. Yeah. That, I mean, especially for such a flexible tool, being in the VP of product role, it's got to be hard to balance doing everything you want to technically be able to do with building something that's really usable, right? And building something people want to pay for, not just they technically would use yeah. and striking that balance and always keeping it front of mind. That's impressive. I, I really like talking to the product folks we've had because they across the board have that focus that if you don't have that user first mentality, you're going to miss something and you're going to end up, you know, just a, another used to be. Yeah, a lot of the product guys, like you said, that we've had on the show, they've been there since the beginning, since these companies started. And uh, the perspective that they have is is really insightful. And I, I love talking to them as well. So, OK, number 10, um, let, let's move on. So you and I have a passion for a company called HubSpot. We oh, yeah. are both huge fans. We're, uh, you know, again, we're, we, we use HubSpot internally at HashMap. But Honestly, I just I love the way those guys go to market. I, I they're they're not an open source tool, but I feel like they embrace what we were talking about earlier. What DBT does, they embrace that community based approach. You were very fortunate to have Nicholas Holland on the show just recently, and uh, why don't you any any initial impression impressions of that show before we get to the clip? Man, Nicholas, I, I could have talked to for a long time. We just click had so many interesting things to say, so many interesting insights. And again, down to earth, we keep coming across these people who have an immense body of knowledge, right? They are true experts in their space and they're just approachable. They're excited to be chatting. So uh, talking to Nicholas was both illustrative for the podcast, but I know I learned a thing or two listening to him talk. A lot of times in companies, professionals will recognize that like, you know, what got you here won't get you there. That's like a book that's out. And yeah. like, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase that totally, it, just that phrase captures everything when you think about it. Like what got you here won't get you there. And the other thing that's interesting is there's a book that, that's really interesting called The Innovator's Dilemma. But basically it's, it's a again, a fancy way of saying like you innovated and you got to this point and that innovation, you want to hold on to it. The problem is, is that innovation doesn't sit still it keeps on going and so this yeah. whole like innovation that got you here is not the innovation that's going to get you there i tell you all of that because we had a long time ago with our marketing product for example we wanted to solve for the customer we wanted their success to be our success and so one of the proxies that you do for that is the size of the database and contacts yeah. So think about that. So here we are in a world where I'm like, you know, oh, I want to make Randy more successful. Randy's crushing it. He's using more of the software. The leads are flowing. And so as he grows his database, he's like, man, I am growing. I'm OK paying HubSpot more. That works. Yeah. Let's fast forward, you know, a few years where now we have everything is now digital. It's not a clean funnel where everybody's just raising their hands saying they just can't wait to, to work with Randy and HashMap. And so at the end of the day, you've got leads that are not all the same quality now. You've got a varying degree of people engaging and working with you. More importantly, you've been in business now in the digital world for years. And so you've got leads that you no longer are engaged with. And then you got the sales team and man, they're really brutal about the leads they put in the system. I mean, literally, if someone has like fogged a mirror, they're like, oh, my God, oh, yeah. it's an opportunity. Let's put it in the system. 
and boom, zero percent. Yeah, zero, yeah. zero percent chance, but, but I'm going to work. I'm going to call them twelve times. So, anyways, so that became a case where we were charging for contacts, but that mm-hmm. wasn't really working for the customer. And you know, we had spent years building a business around that. And think about that. The innovation that we put into that was really key to our success early on, but now it was holding us back. And so, man, we put a lot of energy talking about it in the in our blog post about it. Um, it's actually in our Medium blog post, but about how we just recognized it wasn't working anymore. It wasn't solving for the customer. It wasn't meeting them where they were. It didn't kind of meet the changes of customers. And so we put almost two years of work into preparing for how do we get to a world where we just charge for marketing contacts, meaning contacts you're actively engaged with in marketing, and we don't charge for the others. And boy, it was tough, but it is a reflection of how like even a company at HubSpot size, you know, it's it's like being a parent. It's easy to say what you want. To ch- it's hard to do it. You know, do what I say, not what I do. This is one of those yeah. times where we tried to make ourselves kind of walk the walk that we that we talk. So. Very, very cool. I mean, so much just in that one clip that I think regardless of company size or, you know, what industry you're in or anything you can take from that. Let me ask you this. It's a little bit off the off the cuff. Was there a favorite moment on that particular show or, or a favorite uh, topic that you went over with Nicholas that, uh, that really stood out to you if it was not this particular clip? Yeah, you know, that that's a great clip. And really, I think just wall to wall. That's a great episode full of stuff. Yeah. Kind of like I, I mentioned earlier with the, the, the DAG discussion with Drew at uh, Fishtown. Um, there was something we talked about in here about the future of like data consumption mm. and about how dashboards right now are the target, but you know, as people innovate, nothing stays the same. And he started talking about how his, his, this new car he got is like talking to him and he can, it like reads his texts and he can see Slack sending him a message when something happens. And it just got me thinking like, man, dashboards suck. Like that's just not the thing. And I don't know what the next thing is or what it'll feel like, but that's been rattling around in my head. And uh, I, I just, in that specific episode, I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, yeah. What about you? I, uh, I think that, you know, overall, when I look back at, again, you look at customers, partners, um, you look at internal hash mappers. I, I don't know. I, I think just the not not picking out one particular show, one particular guest. I think that the perspectives yeah. in, in this space, regardless of topic, have just been really, really interesting. I've had a ton of fun, actually. I don't know, I guess you'd call it doing the interviews, having the conversations. I've loved doing the ones that you know we do internally with just hash mappers, but I've also really enjoyed the ones that are externally facing as well. And I, I mean, I just can't say thank you enough to all of our guests that have come on the show, uh, given up their time and, and uh, really been extremely insightful and thoughtful uh, throughout this process. So just, just a huge thank you to everybody that's come on the show today and I got to say to our producers as well, Lee and Jack, yeah. just doing a fantastic job on that. Yeah, I I agree with the the fifty episodes. I mean, I, I didn't imagine we would go this regularly or this long, um, but it, it's become a real highlight and a, a useful tool, both for coming up with new ideas or getting new insights, and really as a tool for talking to people who ordinarily, you know, if just in the day to day workflow, we don't get a chance to cross paths with and. For me, I, I feel lucky, almost guilty, like I'm cheating somehow, uh, getting this this competitive advantage of having all these insights together uh, and being able to publish them for other people. So, you know, here's to here's to another fifty to a big one hundred, and um, yeah, thank you, Kelly. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Cheers to another fifty, and that was that was a huge amount of fun. I I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, getting to listen to all those clips today and, and talk about them. And as always, just a, just a huge thank you to everyone that listened in to the show today. We really appreciate everybody. We'd encourage you to subscribe to the show. Check us out on hashmapinc.com. Subscribe to the podcast and uh, send us any feedback or comments that you have, your thoughts. We would love to hear from you. And we will see you soon on another episode. Take care. Cheers. Thanks for listening to HashMap on Tap. Be sure to subscribe for weekly new episodes and visit HashMap's Medium blog for new data and cloud technology perspectives. If you have any comments or suggestions for the podcast, please visit the HashMap on Tap page on HashMap's website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in.